Well, this is just so fascinating to me that there um, are so many people interested in lead gen. I always talk about Drupal and project management and stuff like that. And so this is um, my first foray at speaking at DrupalCon on a marketing topic. And my boyfriend's a developer, and I tell him, well, marketing is just kind of guessing, and then you run tests against your guesses, and that just, like, blows his mind and because um, he's so uh, one zero. But um, how many people are actually in marketing? Oh, wow. How many are owners? Okay, all right. So um, let me get started. So who are you guys? Um, let's see. I found some developers. I found some people who are in Drupal shops um, looking to kind of liaison, liaise better with marketing people. Um, I found people that are agencies that actually do some marketing and lead generation. Um, is there another use case in here? Yes. Yeah, no, actually that's really brilliant because often you have a mandate to get information out into the hands of the public, don't you? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Any other use case in here? Yes. So I work for uh, higher education and uh, trying to get departments to realize the benefits of marketing. Mm -hmm. I'm a developer, not a marketer, so I'm kind of thrown into this role, but getting them to recognize that there is a value in marketing themselves and that it's going to benefit them in the long term. Some kind of tips and tricks on how, what things yeah, absolutely. When I started in Drupal in 2004, um, higher education websites came out of the IT department. They would issue the RFP, and then you did a bunch of geeky interviews, and they asked you about server stacks, and you go, uh -huh. And um, so that was that. And then um, they became the purview of the uh, marketing departments, and then lately what I'm seeing is that they're actually the purview of the admissions department. Now, how many of you understand that a sale in higher ed is basically a quarter million dollar sale? It is like the ultimate online um, kind of lead generation. So, um, very, very competitive space, very expensive to advertise, and yes. And there's all kinds of, of things, like even like the um, alumni and the development office, and and even uh, the poor researchers, uh, they have to get funding. There's all kinds of places to have good marketing in higher ed. Absolutely. Anybody else? Any other interesting use cases? Yes. I work for a trade show company. And oh. They're all using for the websites to spare the systems. They're on a nationwide Drupal distribution and rolling that out. But the events that the trade show does range from really small to really large. So it's a mix of their own marketing. Yep. Yeah, you can easily do registration microsites. Yep, yep, yep. Um, someone else had their hand up. Yes. So since you're writing content for the help side, one of the things you can do, um, how many of you know about voice queries? So vo how many of you use Siri or some of, use your phone for voice query? It's huge. So as you're writing content, like FAQ parts, you can actually write the question that you're getting, and it'll help you show up better in the organic results. So you might say, um, how do, instead of how to delete your account, you can say, how do I delete my account? and it'll, it'll actually rank quite a bit higher. Okay, anybody else? Any other interesting use cases? Yes? I work for a healthcare corporation, and so for us, patients, we need the yes. for more patients. Yes, yep. And it is so hard to find a doctor and get signed up on most hospital sites. Like, you know, try to find a doctor and then try to book the doctor. Like, the, yeah, it's not so easy. Yep. Anybody else? That's a real, yes? Uh, I do uh, grassroots Nice, advocacy. Yeah, definitely can do some good lead gen there. Hi, come on in. Come sit up front where I can see your name tags. 
All right. So um, I'm with Flashpoint. I used to work for a company called Thunder Active, and I loved my job. And uh, but the owner got tired, and so I bought the company and the team, and we're now Flashpoint Marketing. So yeah. So I I ha had been in Drupal up until 2014, and then I moved over to Thunder and. Um, and have been doing digital marketing, and I actually really like it. It turns out it's not nearly as stressful. I have to deploy nothing at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so I talk about HubSpot, but um, because we're a HubSpot partner, however, um, there are many, many other, and these are just a random sample. So these things are known as um, CRMs and marketing automation. So Salesforce is a CRM, but Pardot and Marketo, uh, which are also owned by Salesforce, are the marketing automation components, um, as is Eloqua and Infusionsoft. Um, I picked HubSpot about the same way I picked Drupal. Um, someone said, we need to align ourselves with one of these, and I looked at a handful of them and went, that one. I picked Drupal because it was Drupal versus Joomla, and Drupal was the one that had the good URLs. So who knew, right? <laughs> So today, um, you can look at this conversation uh, bi-directionally, and so the slides vibrate a little back and forth. Um, so you can be uh, the site owner trying to get leads, or you can be a service provider trying to help your customer get leads. The conversation's the same either way, because the fundamentals are the same all the way around. So show me the money. So if you want to grow your business, um, and I'm, I'm presuming that most of you in here are marketing or very interested in marketing. However, it's still actually very surprising to me that many Drupal shops um, don't invest in marketing uh, heavily. And um, you know it might be the owner doing the sales and stuff and referrals. However, if you want to cherry pick your clients and not have to take projects that just arrive because you need cash right now, you can actually start investing in a marketing engine. And you can find ideal customers. And you can start specializing because you can actually target the kinds of projects you want, not just the projects you get. And how many of you actually would like to sell your business and get bought out and retire to the south of France or something like that? Okay, yeah. So if you are doing your own marketing, like you as the owner, um, then you have to have some other system because your business doesn't work if you quit selling. Does that make sense? So often, like, I'll do some small business consulting with someone, and they're like, oh, yeah, and I do all the BD. And it's like, okay, great, we can position you for growth. And then what's going to happen when you leave? All of the sales engine goes with you. So um, if you're thinking about like how to merge or, or be acquired, uh, think about that. Um, a marketing budget can be between 5 and 15% of your revenue. A 10 is the normal number. However, um, the more you invest in marketing, the better margins you're going to have. I know that sounds counterintuitive. But if you can cherry pick, then you can pick the ones that are the most profitable jobs and the ones that fit your wheelhouse better. So a little bit of investment in marketing um, is going to get you much better business results in the long term. Now, I also, um, we also do a little work in the cannabis space. So it's interesting. We do enterprise legal work a lot and then cannabis. So it's a funny little mix. Um, but in the cannabis area where people are emerging with a new idea in a new market, um, they could spend upwards of 50 to 80 percent on marketing. So 5 to 15 percent is just an average line for an average market for an average business. Right now, people don't advertise very heavily in Drupal, um, or, or not for necessarily all the, all the keywords that are available. Um, however, if people keep coming to these things, with me than they're going to. So start now while it's cheap. So the big question is not how big is your marketing budget, but the number that you really want to know is how much you, you spend to catch a new client. So uh, if you go to DrupalCon Baltimore, uh, go to my page on the website, there is a worksheet. And if you haven't done that and don't want to bother, don't worry about it. I'm going to put it up on the screen. 
but you can, you can get it for yourself later on. So one of the things that we do when we um, bring in a new client and start a new campaign is we actually talk about the acquisition costs. And so you figure out like what the value of a customer is. So a first year value for a client might be $50,000 on average. And if you go back and look at your own sales records, you'll see some clients were worth $8,000 and took you know, 20% of your team's time, and some people were worth 75,000 and did not take that same amount of time proportionately. And this, is, this helps you understand the kind of client you're going to fish for, right? Because that's what marketing is, it's fishing for new customers. And so you go through all this worksheet and stuff, and what you're coming down to is line number nine. So if a, a, my average customer value is $50,000, and I'm hoping to get a half million dollars in new business this year, for this marketing campaign, not my whole marketing budget, I can comfortably spend $50,000 with $7,500 in advertising costs and um, actually be doing very well. Because, you know, if you spend 10 to 15 percent, even 20 percent to get a new cl customer, that's a good return. So, anybody else have their own stats on this? Does anyone know their client acquisition costs? Nope. Okay. So, this is all really good math. It helps you understand um, what you can spend. And it, it was actually a surprise to me when I did it myself, right? Because sometimes, you know, I go off with these things in my head, but sitting down, it's like, oh, heck, I, I have a pretty big marketing budget. So, um, that was actually fun. And then, um, so you guys can do that on your own. But that number is going to actually be higher than you think. And for your clients, you can, like, let's say that uh, you came to that number with your client and to that $50,000. Like, that might be the money for the site, right? The site development along with the content and stuff. So sometimes, you know, marketing, they don't want to spend a lot on a site. But if you can help them derive an entire budget for the campaign, then you can actually say, okay, but you have $100,000. Let's spend 20 of it on building something amazing on the website, right? So you can, you can argue for your own budget. Any questions on that? Okay. And does anybody know their cost per customer? I'm not going to ask you what it is, but did anybody know that before they got here? Okay, cool. Any questions? All right. So, how many of you know what lead gen is? Conceptually, like you understand the premise. Okay, how many of you actually know all the components that go into a campaign, all the little bits and bobs? Because there's a lot of them. Okay, not too many. Okay, oh, this is all going to be good information then. So, in 2004, IT ruled the world of websites, and they said, hey, I, we put up a site and look at all the traffic you got. Yeah, some of it's from Pakistan and some link farms in Poland, but you know, we got traffic coming to the site and nobody knew any different and they went, wow, that's great, we're getting hits. And it's, but you know, we evolved. And so now in 2017, um, it's the marketing end. How many of you have seen this progression over the last five, 10 years? Yeah. And it's really a shock to the system because now people are going, could you move that over a pixel? Could you move that up a pixel? And, and then I need lead little things that twirl and engineers are going, just tell me what to build. Um, and so sometimes that, that transition has not gone well. And I think the companies that have done well are the ones that actually really understand marketing, right? Because it's not about traffic anymore, it's about this what actually yielded a meal. So you can call it lead generation, you can call it marketing automation, you can call it content marketing, you can call it inbound marketing. At the end of the day, what they're saying is we're doing all of this other stuff because the website must drive revenue results. And if you're designing in the absence of that thought, you're missing the boat and you're becoming obsolete. I knew a guy who was really great in Fox Pro. He was a fabulous developer, made tons of money. And when I met him, um, he had resigned himself to just being a project manager because he said, I can't learn anything new. I'm done. So 
this next iteration of web development, you have to fold in this marketing conversation um, to remain relevant. So you want your marketing team to go, my Drupal team totally gets what I need. Like that's, that's the goal that you want to get to. And if, you're, if it's your own company, that your own marketing person says that too. And what your job is as a development company is to help them prove ROI. So we're working with a large, 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 bloated nonprofit. And we've been working with them for a year, trying to get them to where they can prove that their event registration page, someone else had a conference site. So their event registration page, they spend $80,000 a year a year, no, 8,000 a month, so that's like 108,000 a year, 96,000 a year, on AdWords, just on AdWords. And they cannot prove ROI yet because their IT team are, is dragging their heels, will not help and support Google Tag Manager implementation, um, has basically said, yeah, it's all JavaScript, but you're the marketing department, you guys figure it out. Well. I don't know about you, but I know very, very few marketing people that know anything about dropping JavaScript onto a page. And so this fight is massive internal battle, and I think it's going to end up with the, IT, with the marketing team getting fired and the IT team getting fired. Like, I think the, they're going to clear clean house. And there's no actual logic and reason for this discourse, right? Um, and it's all about the that IT slash development has to understand that dropping in code onto a page template is not the purview of marketing. Do you really want me dropping anything into your page templates? No, right? So, um, so this person, this is what they're doing. Oh, how am I not in my slide view? Have I been out of that all the time? <laughs> you guys need to speak up. Okay, so good thing I had all good notes in there. <laughs> okay, so on the left side is all the strategy. So before we even get into a campaign, we have to go through all of this business develop and business analysis um, and doing all of this work. And then on, it, this is actually on that worksheet, so one side is the worksheet and the other side is this, because this is the, the distillation of a lot of thought. So. It's important. And then on the gray, the gray side, the second column, that's all. So month one, we basically do all strategy. And month two, we actually do all implementation. And so the marketing people are going to come to you having done their strategy. And where they're going to be thwarted is if they're trying to shove all this into a website and you're like going, huh, I, I don't know. You just tell me what you want. Like that's not a useful conversation. You know, tell me what you want to build and I'll build it doesn't actually move. It's such a passive aggressive way to approach your client, right? So um, the first one on the gray side, we're just going to talk about the gray side, is optimizing um, the website. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But a website is not just to post content. A website is actually to capture, to um, capture leads and to funnel them into someone on the sales team going, woohoo, I got a live one, let's go. So there's usually, we, we work with a, um, we come in after this very, very famous uh, website design company, but they refuse to put things like a contact button or H1s or alt tags or <laughs> Uh, all, the, all the things we need um, to actually make the website perform. They have no uh, call us now. They have no request a quote. They have no forms. They build the site. It's all beautiful imagery, and it's gorgeous. I give them that. And it doesn't convert a single human being. So they spend six figures on this website and a year and a new brand, and people come to the website, they're staying longer, and then they just drift off because there was never an ask. Never an ask to stay informed, get connected, get a consultation, download anything. And there's no way to track the value of this very, very, very beautiful website. And then we get to be the bad guys and come in and say, and we need a form here, and we need a button. And Remember, this is a, a, a firm that has just battled 
tooth and nail over the last year over every pixel, and now we're going, yeah, it's not good enough. And I really, really would like not to do that anymore because it, it, it disheartens them, and it's a long uphill battle for us. So after that, after we do the whole conversion optimization on the website, we um, develop content offers, we figure out which channels we're going to promote, and then we build out landing pages and thank you pages. So now for the landing pages and thank you pages, how many of you do RFPs or you, you kind of bid for jobs? Like, you can make yourself so much more valuable if you bring all of this conversation into your RFP. Who are we integrating with? How, what does your sales funnel look like? Um, what kind of landing pages do you want? Oh, and by the way, in our quote, we've built you three different kinds of landing pages and thank you pages. The marketing people go, we want them, we want them, this is one, I don't know, I, we, this is what we want, right? So tailor your, your whole conversation and follow up for your projects around what your marketing team is trying to do. Because remember, they just spent hours and hours and thousands of dollars on this left-hand column, and then you can come in here on the right-hand column. So the conversion forms, like even the contact form, like even if they don't have a CRM, build them a view. Like how many of you know where to go to the contact form and find the form results and blah, 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 and then it doesn't look like much? And how many of your clients know how to do that? Right? They're just taking their email notifications and stacking them up and having someone transfer them over. Like, make this simple for them. Build them a view of that contact form. Let it be sortable. Let it be exportable into an Excel file so somebody can do something with it. Like, that just little nicety is so important. And then on the dashboard, you can put a button that says, see your contact form results, and it takes them to that view. Right? Like, like be reverse engineering your marketing team needs. And then um, analytics, like if they're in Pardot or, or any of the other things, those, uh, those little marketing automation softwares actually have the forms. So you're not going to be building so many forms in Drupal. You're going to be embedding forms. So let them know in the bid. It's like, you know, Drupal form and or embedded form from your marketing automation or CRM tool. It'd be like, oh, like, it, like for them, it's going to be like angels and the choir singing, right? Um, lead tracking, and I haven't seen anyone do this, but I would love this. So whenever I have um, a button or some sort of action, if I'm not using a, uh, an automation tool, I, can, I could drop in a piece of Google code. Like, wouldn't it be marvelous if you actually like, built me a little space that would drop that code into the right place in the page? Like, that would be magical. Because then marketing doesn't have to go talk to IT for everything that they need, especially around event software. Like, it might be um, sending them off to the Join Now page. Like, maybe you have to be a member before you can attend the event. Or maybe there's a packet that they could download, like the media packet. And you might want to know that. You know, we're driving traffic to this page, and 20% of these people are actually downloading the media kit. So there are a lot of media people. So maybe I need a media page. So this is how this whole thing escalates. Um, and then we build the editorial calendars, which is not so much you. Uh, any questions on kind of this whole development stack around lead generation? Oh, somebody has a question. No? OK. So looking at this page, what happens is that there's a whole left side of uh, business development that's or, a business analysis, that's what we do. And then we build out everything. And it's actually for, the, for this thing. The reason there's a little booklet in there. Often the best lead generation campaigns are going to be around a, a piece of juicy content, right? So uh, it might be 20 best things to get out of your, your event, or um, five ways to humma, 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 right? If it were higher education and you were trying to recruit a student, it might be um, a checklist to prepare for college or something like that. Any questions? So we talked a little bit about the components of the lead gen campaign. So A, you're building the site. Fantastic. You guys all know how to do that. But then you're going to add in all of these different kinds of things um, in addition to just a basic site. 
And then you're going to make sure that uh, before you launch, you help them test their Google Analytics. Like sometimes people are going to be savvy and know, but you can really help them do that. Um, you can do know what social and ad channels are going to use and help them define tracking, or maybe you want to help them uh, boost their social sharing and say, you know, you can do social sharing widget type A or B and, and give them some, some juice around that. Maybe you can help them pull in their Twitter feed, whatever it is, but know that they're trying to get, what they're trying to do is to get people from the social channel onto the website, right? Like it's great to have a Facebook page or a Twitter channel, but at the end of the day, to actually convert someone, you usually have to get them to your site. So in the very, very early days of Twitter, way in the early days, I, de I decided to um, open a Twitter account. I opened it up, and the very first person that pinged me was a retired lesbian priest. So that was like how cool and hip I was. <laughs> but about my third conversation, I actually landed like a $60,000 website, which back in the day was like a big website for a nonprofit. So it actually worked. It didn't, has never done that since, but it was kind of a nice way to start Twitter. So, and on top of that, you're going to try to drive all this traffic and parse it through the machinery of um, the CRM, the marketing automation tool, and Google Analytics. And uh, I feel someone's pain over here where the three things never say the same thing, and they all give different slices of the data. So. Any questions? Yes? Um, a few slides ago, you asked something about lead analytics. Um, I understand like, the goal is in e-commerce sites to get like, uh, some sort of form or button or buy something. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this one? Yeah. This one? Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the metrics that you might want to pay attention to? Yeah, so let's talk about tracking um, and, and conversion. So for, part of it really depends upon the goal of your campaign. So let's say the goal, uh, we had a client and their, their goal was actually likes. All they wanted was Facebook likes. It was the best campaign ever because it's really easy to get likes. You pay for them. And <laughs> I, it's really great. However, you know, the trick is to pay as little for them as possible. And when they were doing it, they were paying like 36 cents a like. And then when we were doing it, we got it down to like eight and a half cents. And sometimes, depending on what we were promoting, like as little as four. So, um, but for them, they wanted to gen up a big social campaign. So campaigns start in kind of three flavors. There's kind of the brand awareness, and that's the stage they were in. They were launching a new product, and what they really wanted to do was to get brand awareness, hence the likes campaign. And then the next step is thought leadership. And because uh, it was for gel pens, there's not as much thought in there. However, we started running contests for great, great um, designs, right? And it's a big Pinterest and Instagram campaign. Um, and then there would later be the conversions where we actually get a site up and you can buy the product. So, and that's the client acquisition side. So it depends on what you're tracking. In this instance, we were tracking likes. And so that became the metric. Um, they didn't have a website, so therefore there was nothing to track. However, in an ideal world, they would have actually had a website and we could track not only the likes from Facebook, but then like creating some sort of magnet back to their website so that we could show that, because it's easy and cheap to like something on Facebook, isn't it? It, it? It's not a real valid measure until you can pull them back into the website and have them engage a little, little more intently, like it might be to sign up for a newsletter um, or updates or things like that. Um, for the event people, it was actually what we were trying to prove is that they spent you know, $30,000 advertising, um, the, ca the event tickets were like $5,000, like it wasn't a cheap event. Um, it was really hard, it was easy for us to prove that we got people to the site, um, but because of the complexities with IT, we couldn't prove the, the submit button because we, we couldn't get that code on there. And so we had a very hard time proving final ROI. And, you know, it's better for us. Like, we drove the traffic that we said we would. However, for them, it's, it'd be much better if they could say, you know, this was our campaign budget, you know, the worksheet. Like, they wanted to finish filling out the worksheet. 
And so that was just the hard part, is that it was hard to prove that last bit. So you actually go in, you have to set up your goals, and I do talk about that a little bit later um, in that. Did that answer your question? Yeah. You didn't sound satisfied, though. <laughs> Uh -huh. I'm, I'm just trying to think of ways for things to kind of optimize on the site and measures to pay attention to. Well, what is your use case again? Uh, a support site. A support site. Oh, so you could, uh, some metrics. You can see how many pages people read. You could do the little was this useful or not thing. You could see how many tickets people filed. like. You can see, you can actually track their path. So they looked at one page, two page, three page, filled out a support ticket. That means that the, they tried really hard to find the content and didn't find it. You could see how many people never read anything and just do a support ticket, uh, meaning that you didn't give them enough opportunities to find it themselves. So then you could work on some interface around that. And you could actually see the, the times that people are putting in their support tickets to see if you should be staffing uh, your teams differently. And you could also see if, um, what would be another good thing? I think if, like what they're, the topic around that, because that would tell you um, this, this area is a miss. And it, it sounds like you might be doing all those things. Kind yeah, of, yeah. Yeah, if you want to, I have a little thing right after this, but if you want to stick around or make it some time, we can talk more specifically, and I could look at your site. Yep. Anything else? Anybody else? Yes. I have two questions about the only. So the button, the, the, you mentioned the GIF marketing feel. Are you talking about like a virtual page feel? Or you mentioned GIF marketing a feel for when they're creating a button to just put in their code for oh, it's, a PDF. Yeah. Well, uh, no, the, the button that I was talking about is there is Google Analytics tracking code or um, that you have to embed on a page to get all your, your parameters. Like you can, like let's say that there's, um, you know, mysite.com thank you. So let's say that I wanted to record that thank you page in analytics. It, sometimes you have to drop in a piece of code, analytics code. And rather than having to go to the page template, like it would be really nifty if it was actually just right there and I could just drop it in. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what that question is. Um, okay. Another. Okay. It can be really time consuming. So it changes so much. And I agree. I don't want a marketing person putting JavaScript on my page because we find out that <laughs> yeah. they break analytics. Yeah. Uh, but or something else, yeah. Yeah. So where, where, where do you see responsibility should lie? Well, I think it depends on, on, but one opportunity that I see here is a support contract, right? So especially if they don't have a big IT team, or, and most IT teams are fairly busy, and so uh, they usually have their own things to do. However, it's a wonderful post-launch support service, right? We'll update your site, we'll do the automated backups, and we'll support your, your Google Tag Manager and analytics tracking efforts and manage your, you know, support your analytics. And you can charge for that just like you do development. And so if you have a bunch of clients that are paying you 10 hours a month, that's really nice recurring revenue, right? So um, I, because I, you, it can't be your responsibility without it being paid for, right? And so um, and then, you know, depending on how big your team is, you may just hire someone who's not really a Drupal developer but just actually understands analytics, you know, and that can be a fairly inexpensive person that's driving a lot of revenue to your bottom line. Yes.
Yeah. Well, that's exactly what we're getting to recommend between our two teams that are fighting is because it actually takes somebody who is excited by all that and, and doesn't feel like it's a burden. And so, like, for you, it might be, like, an interesting business decision because look at this room. Like, okay, it's not the most crowded room, but, but, <laughs> but considering it's a Drupal conference, like, this is a full room. So um, it could be a really good service to add on. Yeah, I, but I wouldn't do it unpaid. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't take on the responsibility um, just willy-nilly, yeah. Because it is, you know, if you mess up their analytics, it's kind of really bad day. So, yeah. But it's not hard to get analytics certified, and it's not that hard to find someone who has some marketing slash analytics slash light front-end coding experience. How, how do you build for the, uh, the amount of time it takes just to stay on top of the learning? Uh, well, you, I, I, in general, try not to charge clients for learning. However, once you're, it's, and it's a much shorter curve than Drupal, right? Like, so, um, so, but then you, you bill out just like you would for a senior engineer. Like, this is highly prized stuff, right? So, yeah, good question. So, um, landing pages. So, this is not the landing page. This is the home page. And uh, this pay, home page suffers from, um, like, too much stuff. So in your, so there were some design and UX people here. So I love Acquia, and, and you know, they mostly get it right, so my little opinion isn't gonna hurt their feelings. So they mostly get it right, but when I come to this page, I'm a little, you can actually make so many offers to people that they don't make a choice, right? Like, I'm more likely to click away from this page than I am to take action. This one's a little bit better. Um, it has one less thing. Um, and they, the, it's a little bit less, more, less colors, right? This is okay. This is HubSpot. Um, but I don't like get started. I don't like submit. So another thing as a developer, what you can do is allow a field so the marketing person can change that button so that it doesn't say submit or download or whatever because they actually need to put an action thing in there and it's going to vary based upon the context of that page. So if you can just make it so that they can just change that button, that would be like automagical for them. So this one actually, um, aside from the little uh, cyan and white problem, on the website it actually looks much brighter and clearer. This is really simple. So this is request a quote, which is a little common and you hear it, but it has a very specific use case here. It says, I'm a buyer that's ready to buy, and I want a quote. And that's why that says request a quote, um, rather than free consultation, which is I'm kind of thinking about, talk, uh, about doing a website, and I'm still in my shopping phase. So they're saying, don't call us if you're shopping. Call us when you're ready to do the deal. So let's just talk a little bit about it. So a request a quote should be above the main navigation and or above the fold. Uh, there is a path that makes sense. Um, that there is going to be a web form, either Drupal or embedded, and there is going to be tracking on the request a quote button. Whoops. Yep. So when I click that, request a quote, there, that is going to be trackable, so someone's going to be needing to drop in some code around that. And also when you get to the request a form page and you submit that form, that submit button also needs a tracking code. That's going to get saved to a CRM, and or to Drupal that where you're going to build a view, and you're going to let that be classified as a new lead. So even if you're building a Drupal view, like pass that parameter through so that they know, oh, these are new leads, and then let them change their, their leads. So that's the workflow on just that one bit. And so um, here are some others. And so when you are bidding on a website, like go ahead and bake all this in like rock their world, say marketing actions, and put all these in and say, we're giving you all this stuff for free. 
And this call now, that's one of those um, mobile, you know, push to talk things, not just a number. Any questions? Yes? I have a question about the landing page. Yes. And I'm asking as, as somebody who uses them, not as a marketing professional. Yep. But if I'm evaluating, let's say there's 10 vendors, mm -hmm. it's unlikely that I'm going to contact them all. Mm -hmm. right? So I have to collect additional information to evaluate whether they're right for me. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I hit a landing page, I end up manually manipulating the URL, go to their home page, go to the about us, go yeah. to the Yeah, so it's, it's a very interesting thing. We're, um, can you hold that thought and raise your hand again because we do talk about landing pages lightly a few slides down. So anything else on the calls to action? Yes? Um, why do you have tracking code on both the submit button and on the results page? Shouldn't you get the same number of conversions? You would think, but no, because someone could actually fill out or click the request a quote and get to the form and stop. And we want to track that. Um, and so... Um, and actually, we don't always do it on the submit button. Sometimes we do it on the thank you page. Same, same difference. Um, but what we, what we want to know is, is the effectiveness of that form. Because you might be losing 20 or 30 or 40 percent of the people. So good question. Yes? Do you track form abandonment where somebody started a form and then bailed on it before they finish? Well, we know that number because we track them getting to the page. And then we track the number of submits, and then we know that delta. So we have, on our site, we've got forms on, the, on almost every page. Mm -hmm. We'd like to know if somebody started it and then didn't finish filling it out. That's, someone, someone very geeky might know how to do that, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't. Geeky one. That's yeah. <laughs> I actually have another question, but to address that concern, um, what I used to do in my past life working at a marketing agency is the first part of the form contains contact information and email address. So if you've got like a multi-step wizard, mm -hmm. the first part of it includes their name and contact information, right. which means if they abandon it, you can actually set up an email campaign to send to them like two to five days later, whatever you feel like a good number is, good and idea. then that will say, hey, we have your form on file, would you like to finish it? And that gives them a second chance. But they have to. But they have to at least get to a save, right? Well, that's yeah. The, if they fill out the first part of the wizard yeah. and enter their information, technically you could use JavaScript. That as soon as like there's an on change on the form, it starts saving that information. That's However, true. However, if you send them an email um, and they haven't hit submit with the email address, that's sketchy, and I do not recommend. It. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if they do hit next, then it's fair game. Uh, in my opinion. Yes, I agree. The, yes. the other thing that I had about um, calls to action, um, one of the things with calls to action is that they don't always have to be a large ask. Um, your goal with moving them down the funnel is to uh, help them with small steps whenever a big step isn't appropriate. Like for instance, um, request consultation, like the gentleman in the back said, that's a big ask. So maybe the, uh, the appropriate one is get more information. Right. Um, and you just continue leading them down the pipe. You don't need to get them to the sale. You need to get them to the next step that leads to the sale. Right. That's the lead nurturing part. Thank you. That's great. Do you do any testing on form links, like whether or not it's a single form or multi-step forms, like any sort of A-B testing? Yeah. So the shorter the field, the better. So you lose about 10% for every ask. So if you have 10... Uh, fields on your little form, um, you're going to have very few people actually using it. And that, I think it depends so much on the UI, and it also depends on how much they really want that information. The, the thing is that the, the more things that you ask for, the less likely they are to fill it out, regardless of which way. And then sometimes with the multi-step forms, if you can let them, you have to give them very clear feedback that there's four more pages, but just three more questions or whatever. Because if they get to the, so you ask them for their email, and you go to page two of the multi-step, and now there's eight pages, you're going to get a really high abandon rate. 
So it depends, again, on the brevity, regardless of which way it is. But it's also good to test. The thing with the multi-step form, it, a lot of it will depend on how well it works on mobile, because depending on your clientele, maybe up to 80% might be doing this on mobile. Yes? So, uh, you know, at the agency I work at, we deal with multi-step forms a lot, and the, the place that we'll use them is like for newsletter signups. Like, you know, it's kind of like if the client wants to collect newsletters, build a mailing list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're willing to give a little more. Exactly. And then if you use something like Pardot or Marketo, what happens if they've been on the site before? Because when you start at the top of the funnel, it, you just ask for email. That's really all, you know, to your point. You, you just start out very light. And then as the content gets more expensive and valuable, you ask for more and more information because you're closer to <coughs> them being a qualified lead. And then if you're using a service, what happens is that I don't have to fill in everything each time I come. They know who I am. Like, do this at HubSpot. Like, the next time you come, they're only asking you for one more piece of information because they've collected the other ten and scraped four from social media. And so, um, uh, yeah, so it's really magical. So, um, yes, any other questions? Great staff, by the way. Thank you. Okay, so... Personas. Who knows what I'm talking about, personas? Okay, I'll go fast then. So it's basically who's your buyer, how do they think, how do they decide to buy, and where are they? And then, uh, But it's basically, at the end of the day, a fictionalized version of the ideal target, right? And what you're going to do, though, with a persona is you're going to reverse engineer their dashboard. So how does this work for you as a business owner? Very obvious, right? Like you want to do lots of stuff with teachers and nonprofits, or you want to do a lot with creative people, whatever that is. So however, why do you care if you're doing uh, development for clients? And it's really simple. If you can get clear on the target audience they have, you help your client keep their focus. So, for instance, I usually tar zero in on the target right away and start asking, okay, and then they're like, oh, and I want this persona and that persona and this. It's like, okay, your budget allows for you to have one. Or maybe it's a really big budget and they can have all five. But usually there's a primary persona. And what you do is actually understand what they're trying to get their primary persona to do. You build their dashboard, reverse engineer it, and then you know all the marketing bits that you have to have for that uh, persona. So each persona has a journey and it can be very different whether you're targeting somebody who's 65 and um, just has a bunch of money to invest or a millennial trying out their first social impact um, giving philanthropy, right? So they're going to link uh, learn, think, and decide in very different ways. And that's why the persona is important in the development cycle because if you're tailoring this um, website to someone between 55 and 75 who's having a major financial liquidation event and is looking at $100 million in tax relief they're looking for, very different content and actions and approach than if you're looking for millennials who you want to donate um, $250 to your social impact funds. So it's a very different way of tailoring the visuals, the content, the actions, and workflow on a site to help them convert. And even if it doesn't turn out to be that much different from persona to persona, just the fact that you as a developer can ask them, what's your persona gonna do on the site? How do you need to interact with them? big brownie points. So who has some interesting personas here? Mm, all for the event. Who's the persona for the event? Someone had an event website where they do events? No? Yes? Oh, fantastic. Very interesting. So, you know, that could be like a lot of uh, like white papers and sharing research. There could be some, um, like that could actually be a place where there could be a good Facebook page and there might be some conversation. Um, 
academia. There could also be a lot around uh, topical events that you could, you could blog about, featuring key researchers, grants, awards, things like that. Okay, who else has an interesting persona? Nobody has an interesting persona, okay. All right, moving on. So, um, so this is the sales funnel. You guys have all heard of sales funnels, right? It's basically how you take someone from the world of, I'm just an anonymous visitor, to a sale. So it's from our school of fish to fish on our plate. And then what pushes people through the funnel is basically marketing automation, which is what you were talking about. It's called lead nurturing. So you drip them value pe valuable pieces of information all along their journey. So you basically Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb them into a sale. So persona-based keywords. So the keywords for uh, your researcher and my philanthropists are going to be very different. So my site needs to rank very differently. How many of you spend a lot of time talking to your clients about SEO? Yeah, if you don't, it's a missed opportunity. Even if you don't do it, you know, offer to talk to their SEO agency, et cetera. Um, what are keywords called in Drupal? Meta tags. Close. Not quite. Taxonomy. How many of you have had clients that have asked you for a free form uh, taxonomy field? Like, anybody can type in whatever. Please disabuse them of that terrible, terrible practice. Don't even offer it to them. It creates a big monster of useless words that search already indexes. So all you're going to do is get a copy of all of the words on the site that are already on the site. It's a useless form of doing anything. But they don't understand how taxonomy works. So you are going to do a couple of things. One, help them understand taxonomy, find out what their keywords are, create a useful taxonomy structure with their keywords, and then show them how all the content on their site can get tagged, including images, with taxonomy. When their site gets launched, they will rank like a beast and it'll be all you're doing. So it's a wonderful way to, um, to help them. So here's some examples just in the URL structure. So how many of you have done this egregious thing of just calling a blog a blog? Yeah. You don't have to do that. Like, it's really easy to just make all the blogs say legal blog. And then uh, I, how many of you? No one here I know. Don't raise your hand because I would be embarrassed if you did. I'm sure no one here ever uses and leaves the raw node 6, <laughs> node 8 thing. Never, never, never do that. <laughs> and then so um, mysite.com slash services on your own site when it could say Drupal services. And it could say Drupal hosting services. And it could say... Um, Drupal design and things like that. So use your URL structures to let Google know this is what you do. How many of you feel like you have really robust URLs on your own site? Just a handful. So lots of good work to be done there. Um, so this is the kind of content that uh, people like to see. And so there's a wide variety of content <laughs> to be made. And then Facebook, as you know, in the fifth column there on videos. They're betting that videos are going to be huge. And someone can tell me why videos are huge, right? Because that's the easiest medium on your phone to get quick information. So you create content for each part of the buyer's journey to attract them to your site with good SEO and then good conversion and tracking. So you see how this is all starting to build. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I don't think like the personas of my clients, they're not looking for a particular CRM, they're looking for a website solution. Yeah, so this is a really big conversation inside of the community right now, right? And how uh, we, I did the, I led the Business Summit on Monday and uh, we had Matt from Pantheon come and talk about WordPress versus Drupal. So how many of you are Drupal only, like purists? Bigger hands up, yeah. Purists only, okay. And how many of you do WordPress and Sitecore, WordPress and Drupal, Drupal and something else? Okay, so it seems like about 
half and half, maybe a little bit more only Drupal. The thing is that it's not the, so let's use chapter three, and you might be as famous as chapter three, so, you know, depending on where you are on the spectrum. People come to chapter three for Drupal. People go to phase two for Drupal. Um, however, I found that most people come to me because they referred to me because I built a good website, and they're still not clear on what it was, right? So I think it depends on what your business model is, and the frustrating thing about marketing, the word is going to be and. So you do need to do Drupal and WordPress and Angular, because headless Drupal is right here, right? And you are going to need to be able to talk Drupal and give it up because it's not that interesting. So it's kind of like that IT versus marketing conversation. The IT people care what platform it's on. The marketing people, they just need to get four microsites launched next month. They don't care if it's made out of pennies and pansies. Like, just get it out there, right? So I think it depends on whom you're talking to and the ability to change hats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can someone tell me how much time I have? Four, three two, minutes. three minutes. Okay. Let's see how many. I'm almost done. So let me let me finish this slide the slide deck, and then let's answer that at the end. Okay. Lead strategy. So everyone knows how to do SEO. We'll do that. And then once you get all your content and you know who your personas are, then you're going to promote through the social channels where your personas are. So sometimes that means LinkedIn, and sometimes that means Facebook, and sometimes that means Pinterest, or all of them. So this was interesting on um, Pound Drupal. I only recognize Steve Perkis, and I don't even know if I know him, but I don't know anybody else. Um, this was for the AdWords keyword term Drupal experts. I, don't, I know Sri John, but I don't know anybody else. This is I know Upwork, and I don't know the other people. So there's a lot of competition showing up. So if you're a Drupal shop developer, and you, development firm, and you're not um, talking about how to get your name and brand out there, it's only getting more competitive. And this is why some shops have closed, is because they've always gone by word of mouth. And they don't, have not put this digital engine in place for themselves. And so it's getting harder and harder to find you. Like there was a time if you just Google Drupal shops, you got Media Current, Phase 2, Four Kitchens, Achieve. Like you could name who, Chapter 3, you could name who was going to be on the first page of those, that result. You can't do that anymore. So you've got to find your niche out there in the world. And don't throw money at an AdWords campaign just because I showed you that. So you're going to entice people to call you. You're going to make it easy. Um, you're going to great, create great landing pages. Great landing pages. This one isn't actually a good landing page because it has the navigation up here. It's very focused. And someone was asking about that. I'll show you um, that. Then you're going to nurture, which is funneling people down the pipeline. You're going to analyze it. So this company, they did like a uh, million dollars a year in sales. And they said, we know our audience, we know our things. So no, they didn't know their audience. They thought all their audience were males between 18 and 25. And more than half their audience was over 45. Um, and then they said, we know how effective our email campaigns are. And then we went in and fixed their analytics. And look at these abysmal numbers. Like 80% of the carts are abandoned. And that's with less than 1% engagement to begin with. So they were, they were sending out two emails a month to, I don't know, like 250,000 people, whatever. And it was all a waste of money because their cart wasn't converting properly. That goes back to the CRO. So we were able to help them, and um, they got sold, and we lost our client. So <laughs> yay me. <laughs> so um, A-B testing, uh, very important. And then always remembering that half the website is for humans and the other half is for Google. And you have to do both. You have to do both. And then you just rinse, repeat, report, and um, keep on going. And that's, that's a lead generation campaign. Okay, now, 
there were questions. I, so I think we're done. So if you'd like to leave, please leave. There are some handouts here if you're too lazy to print that worksheet on your own and some business cards. Um, did you guys get value out of today? Yeah? yeah? Great, thanks. If you have questions, come on up and we'll get them answered real quick. Thank you, thank you very much.